In this lesson, we're going to talk about uh, the currently accepted model for the atom, and that is the model that's described in terms of atomic orbitals. We're going to look at the internal structure of the atom. And the basis for this model is called is quantum mechanics, which and this model is also known as the wave mechanical model for atoms. This was developed by Schrodinger, and the basic idea here of this, this basic idea of quantum mechanics is that for any system, such as an atom, there is a function, which we call the wave function, represented here by the Greek letter psi. Okay. That gives us all accessible information about the atom. So if you want to know anything about the atom, we just need to know what that psi is. And to figure out what that psi is, we need to solve what is known as the Schrodinger equation. So true or false that if we know psi for an electron in an atom, then at any given time, we can use psi to precisely determine where it is, how fast it's moving, and in which direction it's headed. In other words, according to this question, is it possible to precisely know the location and the momentum or the velocity, if you recall momentum is just mass times velocity, of an electron at the same time? The answer is false. Okay? But then we just say that psi gives us everything we need, to, we, everything, all the information we need about the electron. The electron? No, that's not true because this is all accessible information and nature does not allow us to precisely determine the position and momentum of the, of the electron at the same time. So psi gives us information only if nature allows us to have that information. And in this particular case, all experiments have suggested that position and momentum of an electron cannot be precisely determined at the same time. This is known as the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay. So, uh, what's an atomic orbital? An atomic orbital is a mathematical function that describes an electron. Okay. And an orbital does not describe how an electron moves or where the electron is. In other words, an orbital is not the same thing as an orbit. Okay? The notion of an orbit, okay, a precise path around the nucleus where the electron would move, that notion, which was proposed by Bohr and inspired by Rutherford's experiment, alpha scattering experiment, is no longer acceptable. Okay, uh, that's a violation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and so we cannot talk about precise uh, paths for electron around the atom. So an, uh, an orbital, okay, notice the ending there, does not describe how an electron moves or where it is. In fact, it has no physical significance. It's just a mathematical function. It can even be a complex number, an imaginary number. So what we do is to get information about the electron is we perform mathematical operations on that function, that orbital, to get any information we want about the electron. Now, that information, that the kind of information that we get is limited by what nature allows us to find out. So precise orbit around the nucleus is not something that nature allows us to determine for an electron. Okay. Now, the inf among the information available from an orbital is the probability of finding an electron in a specified region. Okay. So because of that, it's customary to refer to an electron as being in an orbital or occupying an orbital. Okay. As if it's as if an orbital is like a home for an electron. Uh, and that's uh, that's a simplified way of describing an orbital. It's really not that. It's it's just a mathematical function that tells you what's the likelihood you might find it in a particular region, among other things. Okay. So uh, quantum numbers are again numbers that arise when you solve the Schrodinger equation, and these are quantities that can only that are restricted. So the word the 
the adjective quantum means restricted. There's only certain allowed values for these numbers. And there are numbers that are associated with orbitals. In fact, you can think of quantum numbers as ID numbers for orbitals, a way to identify these orbitals. So there are many different orbitals that you can use to describe an electron. And so we make distinctions between these using quantum numbers. A unique set of quantum numbers, so a unique set of ID numbers, you might say, that we can use to describe an electron. Okay, the symbols we use for these quantum numbers are N. N stands for what's called a principal quantum number. And it has to be a positive, it's restricted to positive integers. That means you have, this can only be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Okay, it can't be 0, it can't be 2.5, it can't be negative 2. It has to be a positive integer. There's also quantum number called the orbital quantum number or the angular momentum quantum number. Uh, this gives us information about a property called angular momentum for an electron. And this is represented by lowercase l, usually written in script. Okay? And the restrictions on this orbital quantum number is that it has to be a non-negative integer less than n. What does that mean? If n is, for example, 4, then the allowed values of L would be an integer less than 4. Okay, so one, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, those are the allowed values for L if n equals 4. Okay, uh, if n equals 10, what are the allowed values of L? It would be 0, 1, 2, all the way to 9. Remember, 0 is a non-negative integer. Okay. Now, there's a third quantum number called the magnetic quantum number, and that is something that gives us information about magnetic properties of an electron, okay? And it's represented by the letter M, or M sub L, so that's M with a subscript L. And the restrictions, the restriction on this number is that it has to be an integer between negative L anywhere from negative L to positive L. So for example, if L equals 5, then your M sub L, or your M, can be anywhere from negative 5 to plus 5. So it can be negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, and plus 5. It can't be it can't be 1.2, it can't be negative 6.1, it has to be it can't be negative 6. It has to be between negative 5 and plus 5 if L is 5. All right. So let's see if you got those rules. Here's a summary of the rules. Okay. N must be a positive integer. L is a non-negative integer that's less than N. So up to N minus 1, from 0 to N minus 1. And M goes from negative L to positive. So which of the following is an allowed value for the quantum number n? Okay, so let's just look at our rules. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So it can't be 0. It can't be a fraction. It can't be negative. So the allowed value, 2 is one of the allowed values for the principal quantum number n. Let's take a look at this. Which of the following is an allowed value for the quantum number L if n equals 2? So if n is 2, L can go from 0 to 1. Okay? 2 minus 1 is 1. So the highest possible L is 1. So your L, if n equals 2, L can just be 0 or 1. So 0 is allowed. Negative 1 is not allowed, 1.2 is not allowed, 2 is not allowed. How about this one? Which of the following is an allowed value of the quantum number m if n equals 3 and l equals 2? Okay. So what, what are the restrictions for l? It has to go from negative l to positive l. So if l is 2, that means m can go from negative 2 all the way to positive 2. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. So which one of these is allowed? So negative 3 is not allowed, 1.5 is not allowed, 2 is allowed, and 3 is not allowed. Okay. 
orbitals that have the same n, remember n, l, and m are numbers that are associated with orbitals. So if you have an orbital that have this, you have, if you have orbitals that they have, have the same n, we say that they belong to the same shell or level, okay? And we'll see later that orbitals with the same n have more or less the same, and an electron in an orbital with the same, orbitals with the same n would have more or less the same energy, similar energy, okay? So uh, we say they are, belong to the same shell or level. Now, orbitals with the same n and l are said to belong to the same subshell or sublevel. Okay. Now, a more, a more common way of referring to subshells and orbitals is to use a code letter for the quantum number l. So instead of saying l equals zero, we can say s orbital or s subshell. Uh, for subshells where L equals 1, we can call those P subshells. For L equals 2, we can call those D subshells. For L equals 3, we can call those F subshells. So that's called the spectroscopic notation. So what would we call the subshell corresponding to N equals 2 and L equals 1? Well, you'd call it 2, and then for L equals 1, you have... Uh, the code letter is P, so it's a 2P subshell, okay? So N equals 1, L equals 1 is the same thing as a 2P subshell. Uh, for L equals 4, by the way, then L would, uh, the code would be G. And those are pretty much most of what we're going to be needing to describe electrons in a nano. Now, an orbital is specified by specifying n, l, and m. In other words, all the orbitals that we use to describe electrons can have with, associated with them these three quantum numbers, n, l, and m. Okay, so uh, if you specify n, l, and m, you are specifying a particular orbital. So for example, if n equals 2, l equals 1, m equals plus 1, you can say that that's a 2p orbital Okay, L equals 1. Remember the code for this, for L equals 1 is P, right? So 2P, and then you can specify the M sub L down here as plus 1 as a subscript. That's a 2P plus 1 orbital. You can, if you're referring to a 2P orbital, you can, uh, you refer to an orbital as just a 2P orbital. That means you're referring to an orbital that has N equals 2, L equals 1, okay? Now, you know that your m can be plus 1, 0, or negative 1. So there are three possible orbitals that you can call 2p. 2p plus 1, 2p 0, okay, and 2p negative 1. So since m goes from negative l to plus l, there are 2l plus 1 orbitals in a subshell. Why is that? Let's see. Let's look at a d subshell. Let's say you have a 3D subshell, okay? D is code for L equals 2, so and 3, that means N equals 3. So for this particular subshell, how many orbitals are there? Well, the possible values for L would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. So you can have 3D negative 2, 3D negative 1, 3D 0, 3d plus 1 and 3d plus 2. Five possible orbitals in a d subshell. Anytime you have a d subshell, since your m, I'm sorry, this should be m, your m can go from negative 2 to positive 2. There's five possible uh, orbitals you can have in that subshell. See, this is l equals 2, so there's 2 times 2 plus 1, okay? So that gives you five possible orbitals. Two times two plus one would give you five possible orbitals in a T-subshell. So in general, the number of orbitals in an S-subshell is, well, if L equals zero, remember, for an S, L equals zero. So the only possible value of M is zero. So you only have one orbital. So an S subshell is also an S orbital. 
A P subshell, on the other hand, P is code for L equals 1. So for L equals 1, the possible values of M are plus 1, 0, and negative 1. So that's three possible orbitals. Okay. How about a D subshell? I talked about this earlier. L equals 2. Is a code for a D is a code for L equals 2. So if L equals 2, your possible M is positive 2, positive 1, 0, negative 1, and negative 2. There's five of those, five possibilities. And if you have an F subshell, L equals 3 there, possible values for M would be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. That's 7. See the pattern? 1, 3, 5, 7. So if you have a G subshell, you're going to get 9 orbitals. Okay? Now, like I said earlier, if you write an expression like something like 2P, it means you're either you're referring to the 2P subshell or any one of the orbitals in the 2P subshell. If you notice, the P subshell has three orbitals in it. Okay? So how many orbitals belong to the n equals 2 shell? What are they? Well, if n equals 2, okay, let's look at the possibilities. Then L can either be 0 or 1, right? Remember, L can be 0 up to n minus 1. And 2 minus 1 is 1. So L can be 0 or 1. And your m for L equals 0 can only be 0, right? For L equals 1, it can be negative 1, it can be 0, or it can be plus 1. So that means you have 1 2s orbital in a 2s subshell. You have 3 2p orbitals. So for a total of 4 orbitals. So, how about this one? Which of the following are allowed values of the quantum numbers n and l respectively? Okay, what are the allowed values of n again? 1, 2, 3, and so on. So, which one's not allowed according to this? That's not allowed. What about l? Oh, that's also not allowed, 1.5. What about l? Well, for, let's look at choice B. If n equals 3, then L can be 0, 1, or 2. So L equals 3 is not allowed. Okay? So B is wrong too. How about C? N equals for C N equals 2, L can be 0, or if N equals 2, L can be 1. So C is an acceptable pair. And in fact, what subshell are we talking about here? This is the second shell, L equals 1, and remember your codes, L equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, S, P, D, F. So L equals 1 is a P subshell, so this is referring to a 2P subshell, okay? So there's three possible M values for that, so we say that P orbitals come as a set of three. Which is the, what is the value of the orbital quantum number for an electron in a 3p orbital? Well, if it's p, that's code for L equals okay, 0, 1, 2, and so on. Those are codes for S, P, D. So for p orbital, L equals 1. Which of the following is not an allowed value of the magnetic quantum of the magnetic quantum number for an electron in a 3d orbital. Well, it's a d orbital, so that means L equals 1. Let's see, 0, 1, 2, and so on. This is S, P, D, F. So that's L equals 2. That means your M goes from negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, or plus 2. So that's not allowed. That's allowed. And that's allowed, and that's allowed. So the correct answer is A. You're looking for what is not allowed. Okay. 
which of the following is not a valid name for an at an atomic orbital? Well, let's see. 1s means n equals 1, l equals 0. Remember, s, p, d, f is code for l equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So, this is acceptable. 2s would be n equals 2, l equals 0. That's acceptable. 2d would be n equals 2, l equals 2. That is not acceptable. Why? Because l must be less than n. Okay? So there is no 2d orbital. And for 3p, n equals 3, l equals 2, uh, l equals 1, sorry. p orbital, p, l equals 1. So that's acceptable. So this one is not a valid name. So if we were to list the orbital, the valid names for orbitals, you can you'll find that you get 1s, 2s. For the second shell, you can have 2s and 2p. For the third shell, you can have 3s, 3p, and 3d. Three subshells. See the pattern here. For the fourth shell. You're going to have four subshells, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f. For the fifth shell, you're going to have five subshells, 5s, 5. Oops. You're going to have, you can have 5s, 5t, 5d, 5f, 5g, and so on. So the number of subshells in a given shell is just equal to n, the principal quantum number because that's the, num the number of possible L values would be 0 all the way to N minus 1. So there are N possible okay, subshells. Like if you go 0, 1, 2, 3, okay, for N equals 4, there's 4 possible subshells. And that would be for S, 4, P, 4, D, N, 4, F. So what kind of information can we get from orbitals? One is, like I said, one of the more important ones is the probability of finding an electron in a particular region. You can also determine the energy you need to remove an electron from the atom. That's called the ionization energy. You can also figure out whether or not a particular type of photon, particular photon energy can be absorbed or released, if that would be allowed. And you can also determine how the electron would react in the presence of an external magnetic field. If you were to subject your atoms, put your atoms between the poles of a magnet, you can tell how the electrons would behave. Those are the kinds of information you can get from orbitals. Here's one example of information you can get from an orbital. This one tells you, this is called the radial distribution function. You can obtain that from the orbital. And a plot of the probability of the radial distribution function for the 1s and the 2s orbital of hydrogen as shown here. So this is for an electron in a hydrogen atom. Okay. And as you can see for the 1s orbital, the, this tells us the probability, how the probability of finding the electron depends on distance. So you can see here for an electron in the 1s, as you, this is r, distance from the nucleus in picometer. A picometer is 10 to the negative 12 meters. Okay, So the probability increases as you move away from the nucleus, reaches a maximum value, and then it's the probability goes back down and then goes back to zero. So probability of finding electron at very far away would approach zero. In this particular case, you'll find, okay, if you examine this graph carefully, that the most probable distance right here of the electron is 52.9 picometers. Okay. Now this is a distance that was predicted earlier by Bohr when he tried to explain the spectrum of hydrogen using the um, well-defined orbits. This was what was uh, what Bohr found was the first allowed orbit under his model. Of course, like I said, the idea of orbits is not acceptable anymore. But this number, since this was the uh, Radius of Bohr's first allowed orbit. This is now known as the Bohr radius, and it's given the symbol a naught, and that value is 52.9 picometers. So one 
bore unit of length corresponds to 52.9 picometers. Okay? Now, on this sketch, you'll find that the, for two, elect, if the electron were described by the 2s orbital, okay, it looks, the probability of finding it versus distance looks like this. It goes up, the probability goes up, and then goes back to zero, and then it goes up again to a much higher value, and then it goes back down to zero. So this right here is the most probable distance of an electron from the nucleus of a hydrogen atom if that electron were described by a 2s orbital. So how would you answer this question? For which orbital is the electron on average closer to the nucleus, 1s or 2s? You can see r equals 0 is where the nucleus is. So further away, a 2s orbital describes an electron that's on average staying farther away from the nucleus. So the answer here is 1s. On average, electron in the 1s orbital is closer to the nucleus. In fact, that's qualitatively, that's how you would interpret that's one type of information you can get from the quantum number n, okay? 1s versus 2s, the smaller the n in general, the closer the electron is to the nucleus. You can actually calculate the average distance of the, of the electron from the nucleus or from the atomic orbital functions. In the case of a hydrogen atom or an ion that has only one electron, for example, He plus, you have two protons and one electron in each He plus, or lithium two plus, okay, you have two protons and you have one electron in lithium with a plus two charge. The average distance can be calculated to be, and you can see, you can get that information from the quantum numbers N and L, okay? So it's N squared times one, plus 1 half times 1 minus L times L plus 1 over N squared times A naught over Z. Z here is the atomic number. That's the number of protons in the nucleus. So in the case of hydrogen, Z equals 1, okay? For a helium with a plus 1 charge, Z equals 2. For lithium, would be Z would be equal to 3. There's 3 protons in an atom of lithium. Okay, so Z is the nuclear charge in atomic units. That's also the number of protons as the atomic number. Now, if we're dealing with atoms with more than one electron, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but we can make an approximation by replacing Z by what we call an effective nuclear charge. Okay? And the justification for that is if you have other electrons, if you have more than one electron around your nucleus, then your, each individual electron is not going to feel the full force of the nucleus because it's going to be repelled by the other electrons. Okay, so it won't be able to come as, for example, in the case of a helium atom. If you have two, okay, let's say you have helium, you have two protons in the nucleus. Okay, so, um, sorry. Let's say you have two protons in the nucleus, okay, and you have an electron. Okay, this electron is going to feel the force of two nuclei if there was no other, elect no other electron there. But if there's another electron there, it, it's going, the, the, repul the attraction to the nucleus will be partially offset by the repulsion from the other electron. So it, it will be able to move a little farther away from the nucleus than an electron. So helium atom versus helium plus, okay, an electron in a helium atom would be able to move a little bit farther away from the nucleus than an atom in an, an electron in helium plus. Okay? So this is the formula you can use to calculate the average distance. And basically, what's the result of doing applying this formula? Well, let's apply that. For which of these orbitals is the distance of the electron on average farthest from the nucleus? Let's just calculate. Let's plug in the numbers. Let's say 2s of hydrogen. So N equals 2, and L, you remember, S, P, D, F, L equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So L equals 0. So let's plug that in. That would be equal to N squared, which would be 2 squared, times 1 plus 1 half, times 1 minus 0, 0 plus 1, that's L, L plus 1, over 2 squared, 
times a naught over z. Okay, so that's going to be what? That's four times one plus one half. That's one minus zero. That's a naught over z. And you'll find that that's equal to four times one. Oops, one plus one half. One plus zero cancels there. One plus one plus one half times a naught over z. So that's four times one point five times a naught over z. That's going to be six a naught over z. So that's the average distance from the nucleus. Okay, so we have 6A0 over Z for hydrogen. And if you did the same calculation for 2P, for P, quantum number L is 1. So you plug in 1 here and you plug in 1 here. And you'll find for the 2P orbital, it's going to be 5A0 over Z, the average distance of the electron from the nucleus. For helium plus, it's still 6A0 over Z, except that Z in this case is the Z for helium, which is 2. So that's different from the Z for hydrogen, which is 1. Okay, so for choices A and B, you're talking about hydrogen. So Z for those is 1. So the, the average distances would be 6A0 versus 5A0 versus 6 divided by 2. Here would be 3A0. So, on average, then, among these three possible orbitals, an electron will be farther away from the nucleus in the 2s orbital of hydrogen. Okay. A note here about 2s and 2p of hydrogen, you'll notice that they're, on average, about 5 to 6 more radii away from the nucleus. Okay. So, they're more or less the same distance from the nucleus, 5 to 6. In comparison, a 1s... The average distance for the 1s, the average distance for the 1s is about 1.5 a0. Okay, so that's at least 3 to 4 times farther away from the nucleus than an electron in the 1s orbital. Now, you can actually figure out the difference between 2s of hydrogen and 2s of helium plus because they have the same formula for the average distance except that the z value for helium plus is higher. So your helium, ele electron in the 2s orbital of helium would be halfway, okay, from the nucleus compared to the same electron in a 2s orbital of hydrogen. And the reason for that is your helium electron is going to be pulled more strongly towards the nucleus because you have an extra proton in your nucleus. So if you apply that formula, you'll find that in general, electron is farther from the nucleus on average because at any time it can be very close to the nucleus or very very far away so we're just talking about average here an electron would be farther on average from the nucleus in orbitals that have a larger n so the most probable region is you say is in a larger shell so if you recall earlier we said 1s in the first shell the, the most probable distance is around 1 bore radius, and in the second shell, 2s and 2p, about 5 to 6 times further away. Okay? Now, within a given shell, the larger the L, the closer the electron is to the nucleus, on average. Now, we're talking here about orbitals describing atoms that have only one electron. So, an electron in a 2p orbital of hydrogen would be closer to the nucleus, since this is, this is L equals 1, and 2s would be L equals 0. So an electron in a 2p orbital of hydrogen would be closer to the nucleus than an electron in a 2s orbital of hydrogen. So, OK, so which of these functions here represent 2s, 2p, and 1s? OK, so we expect the 1s to be closest to the nucleus. So that would be that curve, the green curve. And then the blue and the red curve here would represent 2s and 2p. Which one is 2s and which one is 2p? Well, the blue uh, would be closer on average to the nucleus. would represent an electron that's on average is closer to the nucleus. So that would be 2p. And then the red curve right here 
would be the radial distribution function for an electron that was a little bit farther away from the nucleus, and that's going to be your 2s. Okay? So one thing you'll realize, you've realized from the previous slides, is that the function that's associated with, associated with an orbital name is not the same in different atoms, okay? So 1s of hydrogen a 1s orbital of hydrogen is not the same thing as a 1s orbital in helium. It's not the same as a 1s orbital in helium plus or a 1s orbital in some other atom like carbon. Okay? In general, if you're talking about the same orbital name, okay, the higher z would, uh, more protons in the nucleus would pull that, uh, the electron described by that orbital closer to the nucleus. So here's a question. Which orbital describes an electron that is closer to the nucleus on average. A 1s orbital of helium plus or 1s orbital of H? Okay. Same orbital, right? But helium plus has Z equals 2, hydrogen has Z equals 1. So the electron in helium plus will feel a stronger pull from the nucleus, and so this would be closer to the nucleus. You can use three-dimensional representa uh, representations to help you visualize uh, the probability of finding electrons around the nucleus, okay? And one way you can do that is by drawing what's called an electron cloud. So this is, here's an example of a representation of a uh, 3p orbital. You can see the way this is sketched is uh, where the cloud is thickest, you have a high probability of finding the electron, and where the cloud is very thin, you have a low probability of finding the electron. You can also use what's called a boundary surface representation. In a boundary surface, uh, the boundary surface actually resembles the shape of the electron cloud, okay? And it tells us regions of high, where regions around the nucleus where the electron density is high, the probability of finding the electron is high, okay? Now, every point on that surface represents a point, that entire, every point on that surface represents um, the same probability, okay? And so, um, the S orbitals have spherical shapes, so this is the 1S, uh, and this is the 2S, okay? A spherical shape simply means that the probability of finding the electron doesn't depend on the direction you take away from the nucleus. It only depends on the distance. Now, you can have p orbitals uh, that look like, uh, p orbitals look like this, okay? Boundary surfaces of p orbitals look like that. those. They're described like this. Uh, let me show you some a really nice website that will help you visualize these. And you can go to this website by doing a search for, you just do a search for Davidson, Davidson College Virtual Chemistry. And when you get there, okay, you click on Virtual Chemistry Experiments. And you can click on Atomic Orbitals. Now, you're going to need a, a plugin for your computer called Java 3D to be able to see these visualizations. So I have it here, brought it up here. So uh, this is it's a three different ways of looking at visualizing 1s orbital. So this is for n equals 1, l equals 0, m equals 0. So 1s orbital. You can see this is the radial distribution function we talked about earlier. You'll notice what's the most probable distance of the electron from the nucleus. One bore radius. So r here is in terms of bore radius. And this is the electron density plot right here in the middle. Okay, you can see you can look at it from different axes. It's the same thing. Spheric, we say that S orbitals are spherically symmetrical. You can rotate, you can have a three dimensional, uh, you can drag this three dimensional plot here of the isosurface. Okay, it's a boundary surface where the probability of finding the electron is uniform throughout that surface. Uh, this um, Typically, you would interpret these boundary surfaces as a surface where within that surface, you have the highest prob uh, probability of finding the electron of maybe like 90, 95% of the time, okay? So that's your boundary surface.
for an S or you can look at it from different views. Okay. So just looking at it from the x axis, looking at it from the y axis, looking at it from the z axis. So what happens if you want to look at the two s orbital? You have two s orbital. Here's what your function looks like. And what did we calculate was the probability of most probable distance. The average distance was like 5.56. Okay, so here's your most probable distance right here. It's further away from the nucleus, around 5 Bohr radius. You'll notice this is the electron density plot. Now, this electron density plot is color-coded because uh, when it changes color, you're, you're, you're looking at a wave function that's changing algebraic sign from positive to negative. Okay? Now, our probability is proportional to the square of the wave function, so the algebraic sign doesn't really matter in terms of probability. So that's what it looks like. And here's a three-dimensional view. It's also spherically symmetric. Now if you have a p orbital, a pz orbital is also known as 2pz orbital. It's also known as a 2p0. It's also known as 2pz. You can see this is the binary surface plot. If you look at it from the x-axis, this is what you'll see. Okay. And from the y-axis, you see the same thing. You look at it from the top, from the z-axis, that's what you'll see. So, and that's uh, top, looking at it from the top. And you can see that your p orbital is, in fact, on a, the most probable distance is a little closer to the nucleus than the 2s two, two orbital. Okay. Now, uh, so this is a nice website to go to to explore these different functions. If you look at p orbitals, you'll find they're generally represented by two lobes. Okay. That's 2pz. That's 2px. You'll notice in, for, for your 2px orbital, you have a lobe on the negative x uh, along, the, uh, along the x axis. For the 2py, the lobes are along the y axis. So think of these lobes as regions of high electron density. High prob regions where there's a high prob there's the highest probability of finding the electrons. Okay, 3D orbitals tend to be described by uh, well, the 3D with m equals zero right here. Uh, you have you have what's called the 3D z squared orbital. Okay, 3D zero is also called 3D z squared. Uh, you have Think of it as two lobes uh, and a donut on the xy plane. Okay, and then if you have 3d xz, you can see you've got lobes, four lobes. Okay, directed along the uh, in between the z x z and x axis. Okay, you can look at it from from the y axis. You can look at it from the z axis. And then if you have uh, 4s, you, get, you can see every time you go to a higher n, you get what are, uh, you get more of these places right here where there's a high probability of where the probability of finding the electron is zero. These are called nodes. These are radial nodes. These are spherical surfaces where the probability of finding the electron is zero. Okay. So your function is changing sign from positive to negative, back to positive, back to negative. But look, uh, your radial distribution function uh, involves a plot of a square of the function. So that's why it doesn't go negative here. It just, uh, just gives you bumps in the function. But they keep going back. They go back to zero at different certain distances. All right. So that's how you represent orbitals in three dimensions. You may have noticed that we talked about 2px and 2py orbitals while we were looking at the visualizations of the Davidson website. And we have not mentioned those at all prior to that. The uh, reason is that uh, those orbitals are actually 
obtained from the 2p plus 1 and the 2p negative 1 orbitals. Okay? The problem with the 2p plus 1 and 2p negative 1 orbitals is that when you write out the, way, the function itself, uh, uh, there's an, uh, an imaginary number that shows up in the expression for psi. So in this expression down here, for example, for 2p plus 1, this i right here, that's paired of negative 1. Now that's kind of hard for us to visualize. So as a matter of convenience, it's preferable for us to take combinations of this 2p plus 1 and 2p minus 1 functions. So if you take 2p plus 1, for example, and you subtract 2p negative 1, you'll end up with an expression that doesn't have that i. It's easier to visualize. And that's what the 2px orbital that you saw in the Davidson website is. Okay, so um, same thing. If you take 2p plus 1 and add that to the 2p negative 1 function, you get what's known as a 2p1 orbital. Now, the 2p0 orbital is just the same, it's the same thing as a 2pz orbital. And the name x, y, and z has to do with how they are oriented in space. So let's go back to that Davidson website. Here's a 2px. You'll notice it says right here, the m values is plus or minus 1. That's because when you have a 2px orbital, your m quantum number is not well defined. It's a combination, actually, of two possible quantum number values for quantum number m. Okay, so if you have two, and if you look at your uh, uh, 3D representation here of the boundary surface, you can see your lobes are directed on, towards the opposite sides of the x-axis. Well, whereas if you have 2p plus 2pz, then you see here it says here that m is equal to 0. You'll notice that the lobes of your p orbitals are directed towards the z, positive z, and the negative z-axis. Now 2py would be, you'll see the lobes are directed towards the y-axis positive y-axis and the negative y-axis. So combinations of m equals plus 1 and negative 1, m values of plus 1 and negative 1 lead to 2px and 2py, px and py axis. Now if you're dealing with d orbitals, okay, dz squared, you'll see here is as m equals 0, whereas if you have dzxz, okay, you can see that that's a combination of D, 3D plus 1 and 3D negative 1. So 3DXZ right here, okay, is a combination of orbitals with M equals plus 1 and M equals negative 1. And if you do, if you do 3DYZ, the other combination would be, would be 3DYZ. And then if you do 3D XY, okay, you can see that that's a linear combination. It's a combination of functions um, of orbitals with m equals plus 2 and m equals neg negative 2. And then 3D X squared minus Y squared is also, is the other combination of uh, 3D orbitals with m equals plus 2 and m equals negative 2. Okay, so what other information can we get from atomic orbitals? Uh, in the case of hydrogen and ions that have only one electron, so we're just dealing with systems here that have only a nucleus and an electron, it turns out that the energy of the electron will depend only on the quantum number n. And the energy is given by this expression right here, negative r sub h times z over n squared, where r sub h, called the Rydberg constant, has a value of 13.6 electron volts, or 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Notice that the energy here is negative. What does this negative energy mean? It simply mean that, means that you're looking at an energy level that's lower compared to the case where the electron is at infinite distance from the nucleus. In other words, if you want to remove the electron from the atom, you have to provide it ener with energy in order for the electron to be able to move away as far away from the nucleus as possible, okay? So energy, it's just, it's just a matter of convention. We define the situation where the electron, where if the electron is at infinite distance from the nucleus, we define that to be the zero energy, zero potential energy, in fact, okay? Now, the ionization energy, okay, 
is the minimum energy you need to remove an electron. So if you want to go from whatever energy you have, from whatever the energy is of the electron to energy equals zero, remember energy equals zero means the electron is able to move away, as far away from the nucleus as possible. That's your ionization energy. So the ionization energy will just be the negative of the energy of the orbit of the electron in that particular orbit. Now, what if you provide more than that? Well, if you provide more than that, whatever extra energy you have, you provide, let's say, from a photon, becomes kinetic energy of the electron. So this is similar to the photoelectric effect uh, phenomenon we talked about earlier. So you can think of the ionization energy as the binding energy of the electron to the atom. Okay. So here's an example. In a hydrogen atom, which orbital describes an electron with higher energy, 3s or 3p? Well, what's the energy of an electron? It's just negative r sub h times z over n squared, right? So hydrogen atom, you're, talking, you're comparing the same thing, right? z equals 1, one proton in the nucleus. But 3s, for a 3s, n equals 3. For a 3p, n is also equal to 3. So the answer is the same. It takes the same amount of energy to remove an electron from a 3s orbital as it does from a 3p orbital of a hydrogen atom. Okay? Depends only on n. And in 3s and 3p, you have the same n. Here's another example. What's the minimum energy you need to remove an electron from the 2s orbital of hydrogen? Well, let's see. E sub n is negative r sub h z over n squared. So that's negative 13.6 electron volts times 1 over okay, 2s means n equals 2, right? So you're going to plug in 2 there. So 2 squared. So that's negative 13.6 divided by 4. Negative 3.4. So this is going to be negative 3.4 electron volts. Okay? That's the energy of your 2s orbital. That means, okay, so if this is the energy of the 2s orbital, this is negative 3.4 electron volts. Okay? zeros over here, you need at least 3.4 electron volts to allow, so this is your energy scale, your electron to move away from the nucleus, to be removed from the atom. Okay. And that follow up to this question is, if this electron were to encounter a photon that has an energy of 5 electron volts, what would be its kinetic energy once it leaves the atom? Well, it's going to use it's going to absorb 5 electron volts, right? So 5 electron volts. 3.4 electron volts is the ticket out of the atom. Whatever excess you have left, what's the difference between 5 and 3.4? It's 1.6 electron volts. That becomes the kinetic energy of the electron as it leaves the atom. Okay? Right. From which of these would it be hardest to remove an electron? 1s of H, 1s of He plus, or 2s of He plus? Okay, uh, let's just do, you really don't need to calculate it, let's just compare H versus He plus. Remember your formula, E equals negative R sub H, Z over N squared, right? The larger the Z, okay? That means the more negative your energy is harder to remove. Everything else being the same. Think of it this way. The larger the Z, the more protons you have in the nucleus, the more protons are pulling that electron in. So everything else being the same, a higher Z would make it harder to remove an electron. Okay, so let's compare helium. We have 1s hydrogen, 1s versus helium plus. Z here is equal to 1. Z here is equal to 2. 
so it's harder from helium plus, right? So it, answer can be A. Now let's compare 1S versus 2S. Well, uh, what does 1S versus 2S do? The larger the N, okay, so 1S, N equals 1, right? For a 2S, N equals 2. The larger the N, the smaller the energy, the less negative the energy. So, 1s would be harder to remove. Everything being the same, it would be harder to remove an electron from the 1s orbital than it is from a 2s orbital. So the correct answer here is, it's not this one, the correct answer is B. Okay. You can also calculate the the photon energy that would be absorbed or released by the atom, okay, and that would just be the, uh, the allowed photon energies would be the difference between has must correspond to a difference between allowed energy levels between allowed between energies of two orbitals, okay. So for example, what is the energy needed? To, what is the energy of the photon released when an electron in a 3p orbital loses energy and ends up in the 2s orbital? So you have in 3p. Okay, you have an excited high energy electron. And that electron loses its energy and produces light. Okay, produces a photon, energy H nu. And that electron ends up being in a 2s orbital. What would be the energy of the photon that you release? Well, you calculate using the formula. So, energy of the photon would just be energy of. 3p minus energy 2s. It's the difference between the two allowed energy levels. So that's negative r sub h. 1, z for hydrogen is 1, right? So it's 1 over 3 squared. 3p, n is, n is 3 for 3p, okay? Minus negative r sub h. 1 over 2 squared. So n equals 2 for the 2s orbital. So if you did that, what do you get? You get negative r sub h, and let me just factor this out, 1 over 3 squared minus 1 over 2 squared. Okay, so negative r sub h, 1 9 minus 1 4. Oh, and that's equal to negative r sub h. What's 1 9 minus 1 fourth? Let's just do that calculation. 1 divided by 9 minus 1 divided by 4. That's negative 0.13888. Okay, so negative 0.139. 1389 times r sub h, and our r sub h is 13.6 electron volts times negative 0.1389. So that's how much uh, times 13.6, that's negative 1.888889. Okay, so negative 1.89. So it really should be negative 1.88 electron volt. Negative, negative, that makes it positive. Okay, so it's 1.88 electron volts. That would be the energy, or 1.89 electron volts. That would be the energy of the photon that would be produced when the electron loses energy and ends up being in a 2s orbital, coming from a 3p orbital. Okay. Now, what color of light would be produced? You have to change your uh, photon energy to wavelength. Okay, to do that. So photon energy is equal to hc over lambda. Right? So lambda is equal to hc over energy of the photon. And let's do that down here. Lambda. 
equals h, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule second, joule time seconds. Speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And the energy of the photon is 1.889 electron volts. We need to change this to joules. We need to put this in SI okay, for unit consistency. And one electron volt is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That's your photon energy. Electron wall cancels out, joule cancels out, second cancels out, and that gives you, pull up my calculator here, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times 2.998 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1.889 divided by 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. And that gives us 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7, P6, P6. So this is 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 meters, or in terms of nanometer, that's, I moved two places to the right, that's 656 times 10 to the negative 9 meter, 10 to the negative 9 meters in nanometer, and it's 656 nanometers, okay? And 656 nanometer is on the red end of your electromagnetic spectrum, so you would expect to see red light coming from your head. Now, uh, if the, form the formula we had for orbital energies, like I said, only is valid only for hydrogen or ions that have only one electron. Okay, it depends only on n, negative r sub h times z over n squared, where z is the nuclear charge. Now, if you have atoms or ions that have more than one electron, then your, your, each electron there is not going to feel the full effect of the nucleus because it's going to be repelled by the other electrons. We can approximate our E by simply replacing z by an effective nuclear charge, and there are... Uh, uh, procedures for estimating that effective nuclear charge, which we'll not go into, but if you're interested in that, an activity uh, that deals with that can be found at the Davidson website. Okay, uh, let me see if I can um, find that information for you. On your atomic orbitals, there's an activity there about effective nuclear charge that you can look at. Okay. And there's a series of activities here that we can use to uh, explore the concept of effective nuclear charge. Now, what other things, what other properties can we get from the atomic orbitals. Well, I, like I said earlier, you can also determine magnetic properties, how the electron would behave in the presence of a magnet. Now, to understand that, let's first understand uh, the concept of magnetism as it relates to charged particles. Magnetism is something that's generated by a charged particle. And if you have a uh, an electron, a, ch a charged particle that's moving around in a circle, like as illustrated here, okay? So you get a part of an electron moving around in a circle here. It's, uh, that motion will generate, and if any time you have a, a charged particle moving that way, it will generate a magnetic field. So 
there's this this arrow right here represents a magnetic field it's as if you can imagine as though there's a like there's a little tiny bar magnet right there in the middle of the circle that the electrons going around in okay so that that that's what that's how magnetism is generated okay and that red arrow would be pointing to the uh, what, what we would call the south pole of your magnetic force uh, and that's because the electron has a negative charge if that was a proton going around in circles that way then that arrow is going to be pointing to the north pole of the magnetic field okay now why is the quantum number m called the, the magnetic quantum number the reason is each possible m value corresponds to one way okay that the magnetic field that's generated by an electron can be oriented in space Okay, now ele electrons in s orbitals do not generate a magnetic field but uh, so m equals zero for s orbitals and l equals zero but if you have p orbital electrons in a p orbital or d orbitals okay then uh, there's for p orbitals there are p how many possible values of m m is plus one zero and negative one there's three possible ways that the magnetism generated by an electron can be oriented if it happens to be in a 2p orbit okay so this, so that's how we make a distinction between those three orbitals how the m quantum number uh, distinguishes between the three orbitals in a p subshell now this illustration right here is for a 3d orbital so there's one two three four five different ways that the magnetism can be oriented now notice that your north south line of your magnetism is not really fixed this arrow right here can be anywhere on this pre on this cone of uncertainty you say that it's precessing about that cone of uncertainty it's not really pointing here it could be pointing this way it could be pointing that way so it's uh, we say it's there's a cone of uncertainty what we do know is that for particular for this is for m equals plus two for example okay then that we know that this angle between the z-axis and that uh, that magnetism from the electron has a well-defined angle. We just don't know exactly where on that cone of uncertainty it's pointing. Okay, so figure here shows the five possible orientations of the magnetic field generated by an electron in a d orbital. Okay. Now. We have to make a postulate in quantum mechanics that says that each electron has intrinsic magnetism which can be oriented in two possible ways. In other words, uh, the m quantum number, okay, in your atomic orbital does not allow us to fully account for the magnetic behavior of electrons. It seems like in order to fully account for the magnetic behavior of an electron, we have to assume that there's one other source of magnetism. So it's not just the motion of the electron around the nucleus that's generating magnetism. An electron by itself, we have to make the assumption that an electron by itself is a magnet. It generates a magnetic, magnetic field. And the magnet that the, gener the electron generates by itself can be oriented in two possible ways. Okay? It's either up or down, upward or downward. Okay? Since we, we associate magnetism as with some kind of curved motion of the of the electron, like the motion of the electron around the nucleus, okay, we give we give this intrinsic magnetism a name, and we say it's due to spin, okay, so because the I, the word spin conjures up the notion of a circular type of motion, and so in other in other words, what we're saying is for us to be able to give a complete description of an electron, we have to specify four quantum numbers, okay, we have to tell say which orbital it's in and l and m tells us the orbital and then we have to specify how the magnetism is oriented for the how the intrinsic magnetism is oriented is it spin up or spin down okay spin up simply means it's oriented one way and spin down means it's oriented the other way so fourth quantum number m sub s for an electron can be either plus one half or negative one half that completely defines the state of an electron in an atom. You specify the orbital it's in, and you specify whether it's spin up or spin down. When you're saying it's spin up or spin down, you're trying to describe the intrinsic magnetism that's being generated by the electron. 
Okay. So let's let's get some let's look at an example. How many ways can the intrinsic magnetism of an electron in a 3D orbital be oriented? Well, if you're talking about intrinsic magnetism, it doesn't matter which orbital it's in. There's just two ways. It's either spin up or spin down. Okay? The answer is two. Okay, if this question was, how many ways can the intrinsic magnetism of an electron in a 4P orbital be oriented? The answer would still be two ways. Now, Pauli's exclusion principle is another postulate of quantum mechanics. Okay? That says that no more than two electrons okay, can be assigned to an orbital. So if you want to describe electrons in an atom at any given instant, no more than two electrons can be in the same orbital, can be described by the same orbital function. It's like saying no maximum occupancy for a bedroom is two. If you think of orbitals as bedrooms for electrons, then no more than two people to a bedroom. Okay. Now, if you have two electrons in an orbital, they must have opposite spins. Okay? So that means it's like saying um, if there's a limit of two people to a bedroom, one if one is male, the other one must be female. That's, that's just one way you can try to remember it. Okay? Good memory aid. And, and another way of saying policy exclusion principle really says is to say that, you know, you cannot really... You cannot have this two electrons having the same set of four quantum numbers. So the two electrons can have the same n, l, and m. That would be the same orbital, okay? Since you can put no more than two electrons to an orbital, one of those electrons must have, if they have two electrons with the same in the same orbital, they have the same n, l, and m, one of those electrons must be spin up, so m sub s plus one half, and the other electron must have opposite spin of with corresponding to a quantum number of m sub s equals negative one half. That's Pauli's exclusion principle. Let's look at this question. How many ways can the magnetism generated by the orbital motion, which is orbital motion, okay, of an electron in a 3p orbital be oriented? then that means that's, that's another way of asking how many possible m quantum numbers can you have for a p orbital. Well, for p orbital, l is 1, right? p orbitals always come in sets of 3. m can be plus 1, 0, or negative 1. So there are three ways. One's going to be oriented that way. It can be precessing above the z-axis like that, in, in that cone of uncertainty. The other one could be downward. Okay, this is, so this is m equals plus 1 m equals negative 1, okay? And it could be on the xy plane itself is m equals 0. So three ways. The magnetism generated by the orbital motion of an electron in a p orbital be oriented. How many ways can the intrinsic magnetism of an electron in a 4D orbital be oriented? Intrinsic magnetism? two ways, spin up or spin down. Okay. How many electrons can be assigned to a 4p subshell? In other words, how many electrons can be assigned to n equals 4, l equals 1? We talked about this earlier, didn't we? Okay, so m can be 1, 0, or negative 1, right? And so m sub s can be plus one half or negative one half. So four one one. And you can have four one zero positive one half. Four one zero negative one half. Okay, and then you can have four one negative one positive one half and four one negative one negative six possible sets of quantum numbers, that means you can assign six electrons to a 4p subshell. P sub Let's take a look at this question. How many electrons can be assigned to a 4p orbital? Any orbital can have as much as two electrons. So the answer is two. Okay? One of those two electrons must be spin up, the other one must be spin down. So how many electrons can be assigned to the third shell? 
n equals 3. What are the possible L values? You can have 3s, right? So L equals 0. Or 3p, L equals 1. Or 3d, L equals 2. Okay. And your m can be, so this is all 3, right? m can be 0. If L is 1, your m can be plus 1, 0, or negative 1, right? F, that would be your 3p orbitals, right? So this is your 3s, 3p, and your 3d orbitals can be L equals 2, m equals plus 2, plus 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2. So how many orbitals do you have? 1 plus 3 plus 5. That's 9 orbitals. How many electrons can you assign to 9 orbitals? 2 electrons per orbital, right? So 18 electrons. 18 electrons is the most number of electrons you can assign to a third, the third shell. And the reason for that is your m sub s can be plus 1 half or negative 1 half. So you can have 18 possible sets of quantum number to describe electrons in the third shell.